I'm Ann Dart. I'm Tracy Stormy. And I'm Kathy Knight. And together we are It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club, a podcast for mystery lovers. Welcome. Welcome. If you enjoy our show, please consider contributing to the Dark and Stormy Patreon. By becoming a patron, you will help us create better and quality content. There are also benefits to becoming a patron, such as exclusive content and Dark and Stormy merchandise. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash darkandstormybc. Check our website for the link. We appreciate any and all contributions. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to the 103rd episode of It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club podcast. Well, we're coming down the home stretch. We're in the first week of March. Winter will be a thing of the past soon. Say that by today's weather. (laughs) On today's episode, we will have a fascinating interview with Bruce Goldfarb. But before we get to that, here are a few books you may want to check out. We have American Sherlock, Murder, Forensics, and the Birth of American CSI by Kate Winslow Davison. It's put out by G.P. Putnam and Sons, and it's released February the 11th, 1933, in a lab filled with curiosities, beakers, microphones, microscopes, Bunsen burners, and hundreds upon hundreds of books sat an investigator who would go on to crack at least 2,000 cases in his 40-year career. He became known as the American Sherlock Holmes. His name was Edward Oscar Heinrich. He was one of America's greatest and first forensic scientists. With a canny knack for finding clues, establishing evidence, and deducing answers with a skill that seemed almost supernatural. Can't wait to read that one. Next up, we have the 35th in the Alex Delaware mystery series, The Museum of Desire. L.A. Lieutenant Milo Sturgis has solved a lot of murder cases. On many of them, the ones he calls different, he taps the brain of brilliant psychologist Alex Delaware. But neither Alex nor Milo are prepared for what they find on an early morning call to a deserted mansion in Bel Air. This one's beyond different. This is premeditation and cruelty on a whole new level. And that came out February 4th, and it's put out by Ballantine Books. No Truth Left to Tell is written by Michael McAuliffe. It's put out by Greenleaf Book Group. It came out March the 3rd. February 1994, flaming crosses light up the night and terrorize the town of Linwood, Louisiana. The resurgent clan wants a new race war, and the Klansmen plan to start it there. As federal civil rights prosecutor Adrian Rush is about to discover, the ugly roots of the past run deep in Linwood. Then we have two friends of the show who we've interviewed in the past. First, we have Under the Radar by Annette Dashafi. It came out February 25th by Henry Press. It's number nine in her Zoe Chambers book. And then we have Here Comes the Body by Maria DeRico, who is the pseudonym for an old friend of the show, Ellen Byron. That is by Kensington Press, and it's the first in her new Catering Hall series, and it came out February 25th. So we wish them luck with their new books. And check out all these books at your local bookstore or your local library. Bruce Goldfarb is an award-winning writer whose work has appeared in the Baltimore Sun, Washington Post, USA Today, Baltimore Magazine, American Archaeology, American Health, and many other publications. Since 2012, Bruce has served as executive assistant to the chief medical examiner for the state of Maryland. He is the public information officer for the office of the OCME and is curator 
writer of the Nutshell Studies of Unexplained Death. The book we will be discussing is 18 Tiny Deaths, The Untold Story of Francis Glessner Lee and the Invention of Modern Forensics. It's the story of a woman whose ambition and accomplishments far exceed the expectations of her time. 18 Tiny Deaths follows transformation of a young wealthy socialite into the mother of modern forensics. 18 Tiny Deaths transports the reader back in time to tell the story of how one woman who should have never even been allowed into the classrooms she ended up teaching in, changing the face of science forever. We would like to welcome Bruce Goldfarb to our podcast. He is the author of the fascinating book, Eight tiny deaths. Welcome, Bruce. Hi, thanks for having me. As you were researching Frances's biography, were you able to get a sense of any particular reason she was drawn to the study of murder, or was she just like many people today, fascinated by true crime? Well, she was fascinated by true crime. She read the books of Sherlock Holmes when she was much younger, and Jack the Ripper was going on when she was a teenager. More than anything, I think that she was motivated by recognizing the need and saw that nobody else was working towards advancing the medical examiner system in the United States, and so she stepped up to do what needed to be done. Francis also made miniatures of operas and symphonies as gifts for friends and family. Are any of those still around? Are they displayed anywhere? They do do still exist. Her orchestra, the 90 Pieces, I saw it last year at the Glesner House in Chicago. I believe that is back at the Chicago Symphony. I don't know whether it's still on display. It really should be. It's extraordinary. The quartet that she did, the Flanzelli Quartet, is at a museum in Switzerland, my understand. I have not seen that in person. She did a lot of crafts, needlepoints and cross stitch and all sorts of things. And her family, they shown me a number of crafts she's done over the years. There's quite a bit of her creative work that's still around. Her contribution to the study of forensics is not widely known, but it seems that a spotlight is deservedly being shown on her work in recent years. Is there a reason the nutshell galleries have come out from the shadows? I think that the nutshells have always had their sort of fan base. They've been known, understandably. They're pretty well known among miniaturists. She was known within a circle of people and she was known within some police personnel, but not really beyond that. In terms of knowing about Frances herself as a person, there wasn't much beyond that she was a maker of these strange little dollhouses. Her story and her contributions to the field had not been known up until now, and that was largely due to her own desire to be in the background and have the attention on what was then called legal medicine, now called forensic medicine, rather than using her as a hook to write about. We happen to read another publication that I won't mention on the show that kind of portrayed Frances as a bored housewife, but your book clearly shows she was a brilliant woman with a mission. Why do you think that is? Why would you think people would have that conclusion? Up until now, there's been a great deal written and inspired by Frances Glesner Lee, and there's Corinne Botts' coffee table book with these lovely photos, and she the story arc on CSI, the TV show, I know of at least two books of poetry, several one-person shows on stage and all these things, a couple documentaries. It seems that people view her and her work through their own individual lens and they see what they want to see in her. And some see her as a feminist figure or some see her as this or that. And and her story had not been told. Till now, people have been acting on incomplete information and just didn't really know her story. So hopefully that will be corrected. Have you been in contact with anybody in her family? Yes, I still do. We're friends on Facebook. They email me. We've been in touch with her great grandnieces and great grandchildren. There's a bunch of them. I hear from them periodically. Oh, that's wonderful. Does Harvard University still have ownership of the dioramas? The ownership of the dioramas at this point is ambiguous. It's not really clear. I don't really know. They are on permanent loan to the Maryland Medical Legal Foundation 
and for the purposes of teaching. And that's where they are. At this point, Frances Glessner Lee made it clear that she was not going to give them to Harvard. So at this point, I'm not really sure who you could point to who owns them free and clear. <laughs> One of the issues that was highlighted was the use of coroners in many states that were unqualified or untrained in any type of forensics. A lot of them were just appointed for political reasons. Has that improved any since there is so much more of a spotlight on the difference between coroners and medical examiners? It has not improved as much as what people, I think, imagine. About half the country is still on the coroner system. Certainly the qualifications and training, there is a agencies that do certification and training and, and so forth. It's really difficult to generalize about death investigation throughout the country because there are literally hundreds and hundreds of different systems and each one has their own little quirks in terms of what cases they investigate other what circumstances and who does it and what their qualifications are and those sorts of things. From the time that she began getting involved in the field, there were only medical examiners in three jurisdictions, three cities, and that's expanded to somewhere 14, 20, which is still pretty good, but not nearly coast to coast the way it could be and perhaps should be. First off, I want to tell you, we've had the pleasure of seeing the Nutshell Galleries twice. We were so very impressed with them. We saw them at the Smithsonian, and then we attended a talk. But it was the restoration of was the Diaremus. At MedKai, the medical yes. guy. Yes. That was me. So then you invited us all. I, I took the whole group, the whole yes. group, to go see the nutshells. Yeah, I everybody mean. just jumped up and like, yes. <laughs> we, <went to>, <laughs> we were there. So after seeing them, I'm curious, do you find that her work is timeless, or do you think that there are some things that modern forensic would have proven inconcise. You know, unfortunately, very little has changed in the facts of violent death. Violent death is pretty timeless, and there's a limited number of ways. It's, you know, there's blades and fists and ropes and poisons, and and that really hasn't changed. And so in that sense, there's not a 21st century way of killing somebody that I'm aware of. And the dioramas, the facts that they contain, the things that can be learned from them, observing for evidence, that is timeless. And these things, the dioramas, the room that you saw them in at the medical examiner's office is actually a classroom. It's not a museum. It's not a gallery. And so there's still valuable teaching tools that are used today for the purpose that they were made for. You can look at them. They may look a little aged, but I think if you put a little laptop in there or a little cell phone, <laughs> a little television, so they can be you know updated very, very modestly. But they're not that far removed from the way people live today. There wasn't an answer to each of the scenes, correct? It was more or less like learning how to observe a scene. That's right. It's irresistible. People want to solve. I think the human mind wants an answer. Who did it? What happened here? People do, but you have to realize that you're working with incomplete information because you don't have crime scene forensics. You don't have an autopsy report. You don't have the ability to ask questions of witnesses and those sorts of things. So any sort of hypothesis about what happened is incomplete. And, and it's beside the point anyways. Francis Glesner Lee's whole point was to withhold judgment. Don't jump to conclusions. Keep an open mind and consider all the facts. And so that's just what it is, is to look at it, observe it, note things that may be meaningful, and then report your observations. Can you observe it and then describe your observations accurately to somebody else? And that's what the exercise is all about. It has to be very interesting to read some people's interpretations interpretations of the scenes. <laughs> they do. People have all kinds of ideas and, you know, I don't argue with people. I don't correct them with art. It's all subjective. If you see something in it and develop a hypothesis, I've heard all kinds of crazy things and I'm not one to judge. It's, it's all right with me. Do they still have the fancy dinner after the classes? They do. The homicide seminar is very, very traditional. It's run exactly the way it was when she began it in 1945. They still have a group photo. Everybody gets a diploma that says Harvard Associates in Police Sciences, and they still use the dioramas for study, and they go out for a fancy dinner. It's on the second night of the conference. It's early enough so that people can develop these relationships and friendships that will carry over into work. They don't eat off of this gilt-edged china that was 
reserved just for the <laughs> seminar. But it's it's a very, very nice meal. It's really one of the best meals I've ever had. When I went through the seminar in 2013, I had dinner with Francis Glesner Lee's grandchildren, her two grandchildren. It was a real honor to be with them. Wow. Is there one particular diorama you're most impressed with? They're all amazing. They're all individually remarkable for various ways. But the one that I think encapsulates so much in such a small space is the one called Dark Bathroom where this young woman is partially in a bathtub with water running on her face. And it's only maybe seven inches by whatever, eight inches tall by, you know, nine or 10 inches deep. It's a very small space, but there's so much passion. 